Nehemiah, chapter 9. I have a lot of scripture to read. Time is getting by, but since the Word of God is probably the most important thing that will be said tonight, I'll just go ahead and read it if it's all right with you. Verse 7, Thou art the Lord, the God who didst choose Abram, and broughtest him forth out of Ur of the Chaldees, and gavest him the name of Abraham, and foundest his heart faithful before thee, and madest a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Jebusites, and the Girgashites, to give it, it, to give it I say, to his seed, and hast performed thy words, for thou art righteous." And did see the affliction of our fathers in Egypt, and heard us their cry by the Red Sea. Showed us signs and wonders upon Pharaoh, and on all his servants, and on all the people of his land. For thou knewest that they dealt proudly against them. So didst thou get thee a name, as it is this day. And thou didst divide the sea before them, so that they went through the midst of the sea on the dry land. And their persecutors thou threwest into the deeps, as a stone into the mighty waters. Moreover, thou leddest them in the day by a cloudy pillar, and in the night by a pillar of fire, to give them light in the way wherein they should go. And thou camest down also upon Mount Sinai, spakest with them from heaven, and gavest them right judgments and true laws, good statutes and commandments, and madest known unto them thy holy Sabbath, and commandest them precepts and statutes and laws by the hand of Moses thy servant. Gave us them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought us forth water for them out of the rock for their thirst and promised them that they should go in to possess the land which thou hadst sworn to give them. But they and our fathers dealt proudly, hardened their necks and hearkened not to thy commandments and refused to obey, neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didst among them, but hardened their necks and in their rebellion appointed a captain to return to their bondage but thou art a God ready to pardon. Well, that ought to be underlined about three times. But thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and forsookest them not. Yea, when they had made them a molten calf and said, This is thy God that brought thee out of Egypt, and had wrought great provocations, yet thou in thy manifold mercy forsookest them not in the wilderness. The pillar of the cloud departed not from them by day to lead them in the way, neither the pillar of fire by night to show them light in the way wherein they should go. Thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them, and withheldest not thy manna from their mouth, and gavest them water for their thirst. Yea, forty years didst thou sustain them in the wilderness, so that they lack nothing. Their clothes wax not old, and their feet swell not. Moreover, thou gavest them kingdoms and nations, and didst divide them into corners. So they possessed the land of Sion, and the land of the king of Heshbon, and the land of Og, king of Bashan. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We pray that Thou would help us tonight to break the bread of life, to see Thy Word accomplish its divine purpose this evening. Oh, that we would be hearts that are receptive tonight and ears that are ready to hear. Oh, that our eyes could be salved with the eye salve of God until we could see the mercies and the long-suffering and the patience of our God tonight. Touch us, we pray now, in Jesus' name as we try to deliver this message. And Father, for what you do for us and and all that you're going to do, we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. My text tonight, and thou art a God ready to pardon. But I was thinking that Nehemiah, I don't know if Nehemiah was giving this speech or discourse or whether it was one of the other Levites, it really doesn't say to me plainly who it is that said they were in a time of fasting and, and, uh, and the seed of Israel separated themselves from strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers and they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one-fourth of the part of the day. 
They weren't uh, setting a time limit. He said, well, that would be a long service, one-fourth of the part of the day, but another fourth part of the day, they confessed and worshiped God. They had a quarter of a day for instruction and then a quarter of a day to put it into practice. What a, what a, what a concept here. But it worked in Nehemiah's day when the law of God came forth and the word of God came forth. It, it wrought repentance. It wrought a change of heart. It wrought confession. It brought separation from sin. And friend, that's exactly what God wants to do with His Word in this hour is to let it have its right of way. And if we listen to God's Word, we will acknowledge our sin if we have any. And we will confess it to Him and we will forsake it by His grace and goodness. But I want you to know tonight, whoever the author of this discourse was, he started out with recounting and reminding the children of Israel of all the benefits of all the providential, merciful dealings of God with them as a nation and as a people. And you know, that'd be a good place for us to start tonight, is just to stop for just a moment and just reminisce for just a minute of time and let your mind go back tonight of all the times that God has been good to you. The different times where God has stepped in and providentially averted a tragedy or, or there was times maybe when God came down in special answer to prayer and needs were met and God intervened in the situation and calamity was avoided. And friend, that's exactly what the author here is saying. There were many times where God stepped into the lives of His people and prevented them from calamity and prevented them from total destruction time and time again. And He was counting His blessings today. And friend, that'd be a good place for us to start if we think about doing something for God is to stop and count all the blessings that we can of how God has providentially in our lifetimes. There's been accidents. I've been, I've been in situations in my younger years. It's just a miracle that I'm here tonight. There, I, I can remember cars going out of control at high rates of speed. I can remember situations that I've been in that uh, it wouldn't have been favorable, friend, if God, someone must have been praying. I imagine that maybe Granny had me in her prayer. Someone did at that time until God had mercy. And providentially, I could go down a list of things tonight where God has providentially intervened in my life. And I can see the good hand of God. I can see the good hand of a merciful God that didn't let me plunge into a devil's hell. He didn't just say, go on and have your way. He didn't just let me go, friend. And I am so glad tonight that we serve a merciful God. It says here, Thou art a God that is ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger. Aren't you glad for that tonight? Oh, friend, sometimes... Uh, if it were left up to us, if it were in our power to cut some off, friend, I guarantee you, some would have been cut off. Our frustrations and our anger maybe, and maybe a righteous anger at times against sin. But I want to tell you, there's a God who will eventually take vengeance, but I want you to know, at this moment, the doors of mercy are still open. If you're breathing and alive and can hear what I'm saying tonight, the doors of mercy are open and God invites us to, to a pardon if we've sinned tonight. He says He's gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and forsook us them not. He could have left us alone. He could have left this crowd alone and I wouldn't have blamed Him. I've read it over and over for the last 28 years and I still shake my head. God would be so good to them and God would do miraculous things for them. And He enumerated the water from the rock, the manna from heaven, the parting of the Red Sea, the destruction of Pharaoh's army. You just go on and on and on. Even down to the fact that their shoes didn't wear out and their feet didn't swell. And friend, the, the pillar of cloud by day for direction and the pillar of fire by night for comfort and consolation. God never left them, friend. Even though so many times they were, they were easy to leave God. But he said, thou forsookest them not. And most of us tonight can be very thankful for a God like that. Most of us tonight can be very thankful that he's a God that's gracious and He's merciful, and He's slow to anger, and He's plenteous in mercy, and oh, that He's ready to pardon. He's ready to pardon. You don't have to petition Him. You don't have to convince Him. 
You don't have to go through a long ordeal with him if you just confess your sin. He's ready to pardon. It's his will that he pardon you. It's his will that you be saved. It's his will that you change your destination and also your life for his glory. But he recounted all the good dealings of God with these people and reminded them how God had spoken to Abraham and called him out and kept his promise and how God had brought them to a land flowing with milk and honey and gave it to them. Gave it to them. You say, well, they had to fight. Sure, there's a part to play in this conflict. It's not a hand-me-down or hand-me-out. There is a part that we play and there is something that we'll have to do and we'll have to keep our love to God and we'll have to keep our faithfulness to God and we'll have to stay true to our convictions and our Bible teaching and yet God will help us to fight our battles. He helped them. It's very evident when he doesn't help us. You know that? Jericho fell with a thud. AI put him to flight. It's very easy to tell when God's not with us. It's very, very easy to tell. We're easily put to flight. Joshua said, I'll just send a few thousand up there and take that little place. That'll be a piece of cake after Jericho. Friend, there was a problem. And anytime God's people aren't going forward, there is a problem. It's called S I N. But remember, God is ready to pardon. Remember that tonight. God is ready to pardon. He not only recounted the good dealings of God to the people, but if you read on, even part in this, you'll find that he says in verse 15, 16, But they and our fathers dealt proudly and hardened their necks, and hearkened not to thy commandments, and refused to obey, neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didst among them. Not only does he recount the good dealings of God with this people, but he begins, and through the rest of the chapter, much of the rest of the chapter, he recounts the failures. Not only had God been good to this people, but this people had continually turned their back on God. The history is plain, the history is clear. And I, and I do shake my head and I do marvel after seeing all they've seen and knowing all they knew and having the heritage they did. But you know what? I see the same thing happening today. I see a generation that doesn't want to take the way that their fathers have taken. I see a generation that's bent on ignoring the commandments of God. I see that. You see that tonight. And I marvel how that God could have been so good to them, but He's been just as good to us. And we're doing the same thing they did as a nation. And even as local congregation, we're not seeing, we're not seeing our children take the way that some of us have been pulled out of the deep. God has made such an indelible impression upon our mind. God has stamped such a conviction upon our hearts that this is the way, walk ye in it. I long to see another generation pick up the torch. I really do. For you see, I believe in this way. He said, you preachers just like to make the rest of us miserable. I do not. I don't want to make it any harder, friends, than, than the Bible makes it hard. I don't want to require one thing more than God's Word requires. But if I teach you one thing less than God's Word requires, your blood will be on my fingers. If I know it's truth, I was asked a question just recently about a situation. It's a very hard, difficult situation. 
But just as the text that I read this morning, friend, I see no grounds for divorce and remarriage while the first companion's living. I don't find any in the book. And it's very difficult to tell people that. It's very difficult to take that stand in this hour, but I, I find no other answer in the book. And if I give them another answer and make it easy for them to go on in something that one day God will say, it's a sin and you can't get into heaven, and they thought they were going, what kind of shape will I be in? But friends, God is so faithful, and in times of revival, in times of a move of God, like was seen in Ezra and Nehemiah's day, there was a move of God. They separated themselves from their unscriptural marriages. Read the book of Ezra. They had wives, they had children, and there was great crying and lamenting. Sure there would be. But God had forbidden them to marry outside of their race and outside of their group. He said, that doesn't seem right. Friend, I'm not here to sit in judgment upon God. I'm here tonight to, to know what He wants and to preach what He says. And what He says is what I believe it's going to take to get into heaven. But the author of this speech not only gave the good dealings of God, but he gave them a view of what they had done over and over and over, which was leave the God that loved them and the God that had done so much for them. But remember, God is ready to pardon. Remember that tonight. God is ready to pardon. Pardon implies... If you just think of the word and get a word picture, and what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of pardon? If you go all the way back, friend, you think there must have been a crime somewhere. Something was committed. There was a crime. If there's going to be a pardon, there had to start with a crime. There had to start with something that was committed against someone. Friend, if God is going to give a pardon, the crime is against Him. Sin is against God. It affects people. People are often affected by it and hurt by it. But I want you to know that sin is first and foremost against God. But pardon implies that there's been a crime, there's been wrongdoing. Pardon also implies that you've been caught. Because you wouldn't be seeking a pardon if you hadn't been convicted. You'd still be running from the law. You'd still be a fugitive. You know, in God's economy, it'd be better to be a convict than a fugitive. Think with me. Think about it. You're running from the law. You're, you're not seeking the pardon. You're not seeking the help. You're running. You're running. You're a fugitive. You're hiding. It's an awful place to be because I want to know, you to know tonight there's no place you can hide from God. <laughs> But if you're a fugitive from God, that would be terrible. But if you were convicted and caught, it's not, I don't want to be brought to justice. Friend, mercy is in opposition to justice. Every one of us would run from what we deserve to get. There's not a one of us would come before the judgment seat of God and say, give me what I deserve. You'd be the biggest fool that ever walked to tell God to give you what you deserved because we deserved hell and we deserved eternal death because all of us have sinned. But when we're convicted and caught by the blessed Holy Ghost and pardon implies that you've done something wrong and it also implies that you've been caught. But you can come before the judge of all the earth and say, Father, I have sinned. I have sinned before God and I'm no more worthy to be called your son or daughter. But make me one of your servants and God in his infinite love and mercy after we've been caught and been convicted. Yes, you're guilty. But Father, I'm not pleading for justice. I'm pleading for mercy. And a God who says I'm ready to pardon gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, God said, he forsook them not. And if he would put up with that crowd in the way they did, I believe that some may could find forgiveness tonight. 
pardon implies that there was a wrongdoing, and pardon implies that we've been caught, and pardon implies that we've been convicted, and pardon implies that we've been released. We've been released from the charges. We've been freed from the charges. I think of Brother Walker down at the mission. I don't remember now exactly what the crime that he had done. It was something... And after he got saved, he realized he needed to make it right. And maybe he took something from the United States Army when he was in there. I'm not real clear now. Maybe some of you might remember from his testimony exactly what he had done, but it bothered his conscience to the point that after he got saved, he wrote a letter to the President of the United States and confessed his sin or crime against the United States government and asked the President of the United States to issue him a pardon. Well, if you'd go to Brother Walker's house down there, that little house on the mission grounds, and say, Brother Walker, I'd like to see your pardon, your executive pardon. He could show you the signed document where the President of the United States issued him an executive pardon, freeing him from the crime and any penalty or punishment of that crime that might be forthcoming. I say, friend, Jesus wants to do that for us. If the President of the United States can issue a a pardon against a crime against the government, I believe tonight that our great God can issue a pardon that will clear us from every crime against the high universal government of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. But pardon implies a freedom, a release from the charges and the penalties and the guilt of sin. I'm glad that he's a God that's ready to pardon. But you have to know that the consequences and the result of that pardon is going to issue you a stay of execution. For you see, sin against God carries a capital punishment. Sin against God carries a death sentence. Do you know that? The wages of sin is death. You know that the soul that sinneth it shall die. We know that. We've heard this over and over. But the consequences of a pardon is a stay of execution. Sins would have us killed. But a loving Savior this evening would say, I'll I'll pardon him. I'll give him a stay of execution. I'll give him an acquittal of the charges. And I can almost in my mind's eye seeing a fellow on death row and hear the the guard coming down that long corridor with his heels clacking on the hard concrete or tile floor. On his belt jingles a ring of keys and that prisoner down there on death row waiting his time of execution and all of a sudden coming to his door and stopping and the The fellow on death row looking up, not a lot of hope in his eyes. He figures he's going to get what he deserves. But lo and behold, that guard inserts a key into that cell door and unlocks the door and with a flip of his hand swings the door open and says, Sir, you're free to go. Free to go? free to go? You mean, I don't have to pay for my crimes? I don't have to pay for my injustices? I don't have to pay for what I've done? No, sir, someone else paid your penalty. There's a God that's ready to pardon tonight. Pardon your transgressions. Pardon your iniquities. He was wounded. My transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. Chastisement of I, my peace was upon him, and with his stripes I can be healed. My cell door flew open one day. The vacant cell now. Through the vacant cell, the song of triumph rings. The comforter has come. Jesus came and took my penalty and bore my debt and paid it in full. And he's a God that's ready to pardon tonight and release you from the jailhouse of sin and free you to start a new life. 
with a clean slate. You say, well, I can't forget. No, you may not. You say, others won't forget. No, they may not. But I'm going to deal with one and one only at the judgment, and his name is God. And God said, I will remember your sins no more. He said, I will remove your transgressions as far as the east is from the west. So far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Friend, I want you to know tonight there's a God that's ready to pardon. There's a God that's merciful and slow to anger, plenteous in mercy, great in kindness tonight. Read it in chapter 9 and verse 17. They forsook, they refused to obey. Neither were they mindful of His wonders, but God was still ready to pardon that crowd when they would turn around and repent of their sins. A freedom to start and build a new life. Thank God for a new life. Thank God for the opportunity to do things differently than I started out doing them. I got diverted on the wrong road, like some of you are getting diverted onto the wrong road. I had some promising things to start out with. I had a high academic uh, situation until I got in the eighth grade and got with the wrong crowd. I might have could have developed my mind to a greater degree if I'd have stayed with that. There's a lot of things in life that when we get on the wrong road can hinder our future potential. But I'm glad tonight that God in His infinite love and mercy is ready to forgive. How do you go about it, preacher? How do you get a pardon? Well, you have to look to the one that has the power and the authority to issue it. I can't. No one else in this room can. But we know, we know who to turn to, don't we? His name is Jesus. He's willing to pardon. There must be someone with the ability to pardon us. There must be someone that is willing to pardon us. And I've already told you, Thou art a God ready to pardon. So will I have to persuade him? No, he's ready. That's right. Will I have to twist his arm? No, he's ready. That's right. Praise the Lord. Will I have to struggle with him? No, the only struggle is with yourself and sin. It's not to get God to do it. It's to get you to surrender to God. That's where the struggle is. The person must be willing. And the individual convicted must be willing to accept the pardon on God's terms. And that is that we confess our sin, that we repent of our sin, and that we start out on a new way. I'm glad tonight that there is a God that's ready to pardon. I want us to stand tonight with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I want every Christian that knows the value of prayer to pray. And I want everyone that doesn't know clearly tonight that you're ready to meet God to, to consider coming to this altar. To meet a God that's ready to pardon. He did not put any restrictions. He did not put any fine print. He did not put anything there that would say, I'll forgive you if, or I'll forgive you unless. He didn't say that. He said, I'm a God that's ready to pardon you tonight. Friends, tonight I beg of you, if you have a need tonight, I, I beg you tonight to turn to Jesus, a God that is merciful and long-suffering, of great kindness and plenteous in mercy, a God who is ready to pardon us tonight. If there is sin in our life, we need a pardon because sin will be our downfall. It will be our destruction if we fail to get it under the blood. Is there one tonight that would say, Preacher, I do need, I have been caught. I know I've sinned. I, there's no question there's sin in my life and I need Jesus to forgive me. And I'm ready to confess it to God and I'm ready to, to let God have His way and thank God there's one on the way and there should be probably at least a half a dozen, maybe more tonight. I feel like there's some real needs, church, and if we're going to see God move, we're going to have to take the lead and 
We're, we're going to have to just come out and let God help us tonight. There's needs in this congregation. Thank God for those that are coming. And I'm not trying to unchristianize you tonight, but you know there's needs. How about it? How about it tonight? Let's mind God. Let's mind the Lord tonight. Let's get this matter settled. Let's get back. Let's give God the glory tonight for all He's done. Think about all the good things He's done for you. Think about all the times He's spared your life. And think about all the things that He's given you. You are a blessed individual just to be born in America. You have ate better and you have lived better than much of the world will ever know just by being born here. God has been good to you. If you've been born in a Christian home and been raised in a church, you have the truth and you know the truth. God has been good to you. God has done miracles in your life. God has spared you and your family. And He's answered prayer and He's met needs. Friend, if there's a need in your heart tonight, look how good God has been to you. What are you waiting on tonight? God is ready to pardon. God is ready to pardon tonight. God is ready to meet your need. Won't you come and pray? Won't you come and pray tonight? Jesus loves you. He cares. He's, you know, there's so much. There's this, this, it, it, I marvel. But there will come a time. There will come a time when he says, Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works had been done in thee, had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. There will come a time, friend, when Jesus let us have our own way. You don't want to do that. You don't want to go that far. But I believe God is ready to pardon tonight everyone that will come unto him and repent and acknowledge to him their need. Anyone else coming? Dear friends, Dear friends, would you be ready to meet Jesus if, he, if the trumpet sounded tonight? It is two minutes to eight. Two minutes to eight on Sunday night. What if the trumpet sounded at eight o'clock? Brother Bob Dyer was sitting in his living room last evening talking to his wife, jesting and joking about a situation that they were aware of in good, clean humor. They were laughing together. They were talking together. He started a sentence. Two words came out and the sentence was never completed. It may never be completed. Are you any different than Bob Dyer? You're immortal. You're dependent upon your heart continuing to beat. You're counting on that to happen. Friends, let's not, let's not impose on the mercies of God. Is there anyone else tonight? Anyone else tonight that wants to pray? We want to pray with you. I'd make a start tonight if I were you. And I'd ask God, if I don't have enough conviction to pray clear through tonight, to give me the conviction. Lord, help me to get back to God. Help me to get to God. Help me to get free from sin. Help me let it not be my ruin. Anyone else coming, we're going to pray with these that are here. Christians, let's gather in and have a good season of prayer. If you want to gather in with us, we'd be glad to have you come.